I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, who I am as an artist, where I came from, what I do in my daily life, my personal work, and then I'm going to show some ZBrush work. Um, so let's start. The background. I'm a kid of the 80s. That's the thing that inspired me when I was growing up. Uh, I grew up at a graveyard. Graveyard? Graveyard for cars. We had a garage, right? And there's nothing creative happening there. So I, had, I was so lucky that my mom was, let's say, uh, really supporting me and she got me let's say crayons and everything and um, from a very early age like I started drawing and, and creating stuff and uh, while doing this like I was watching video tapes because VHS was big back in the 80s and one day like I couldn't go to the video, video store and my mom got a surprise tape for me and that surprise tape was let's say this one and my mom thought that was a good idea to get it especially when you're let's say seven six years old you know uh, and she saw this guy on the cover and this guy like triggered me a tiny bit, but she didn't hold this guy uh, in, in, in the back of her head. And this guy, let's say, started my whole career. Like being triggered by creatures and monsters and everything, like really evoked my, my creative passion. And I started drawing more of those and then and, and so on. And the good thing of that age is like there are many more. So like after that one movie, more movies came and it inspired me like to go on. And then I, found, I thought like maybe I can go to animatronics or something like how do they do these things, these puppets. By, by 92, like Jurassic Park came out. I was 12 years old. I was like, oh, OK, so they don't need to be puppets anymore. Maybe it could be VFX. So I went looking and back in the day, pre-internet, uh, it was real hard to find a VFX education. So what I did was like I studied classic arts first because I was still drawing and painting and sculpting and everything. And then I decided to study animation film because I saw like the connection point. Like if I do this, like study the animation trial, maybe I can also someday, let's say, make the monsters and everything can get uh, come together. And after my studies, I went looking for work. I came in the post production house. It was very small, it was color grading and everything. but by only doing color grading and let's say small VFX, like it didn't trigger the, the, the monster thing that was still happening, you know, the creature thing. And like there was this one day that I saw an image in a magazine and it was created by uh, Rick Baker. And, oh, sorry. It was created by Rick Baker and this kind of triggered my, my whole thing. Like I had 3D when I was studying it. It was box modeling and this looked super organic. I was like, that's cool. And I like went looking for it and was like, trying to figure out the magazines, like what's this program? What's this magical thing that creates this ultimate super detailed monsters? Uh, and it was ZBrush. And then like I found a copy and I started playing with it for a few months. And then after that, like I started posting work and after a few months, like on the forms, people were reacting to it, responding to it. And I was like, oh yeah, this is cool. And then like at a certain moment, like I eventually also got a few small job offers that people say like, hey, can you do this or that? And I was like working full time on that VFX job. And I was thinking like, let's ask my boss to, to do some freelancing on the side. And he saw, and he told me like, ah, I don't think that's a good idea. If you're going to go freelancing, do the whole thing, you know? So I quit my job in a possibility to have one possible job that could me, give me, let's say, uh, an offer for one day. So it was like a big leap, you know, giving up steady life and jumping into the, to, to the unknown. But luckily it turned out well for me over the past 12 years. Um, and this is some of the professional work that I do. Like a lot of people know my stuff online and they all see, on, only see creatures and monsters and everything. But professionally, like I'm in a lot of different industries and these are is all, let's say, created by ZBrush. So on this side, you see um, the bottle, glassworks, so you can create bottles. Then you go to the whole glass industry, they make molds and everything. Uh, I did a bunch of toys for the Avengers, Iron Man. Like there, there's, for instance, next to the Iron Man, there's a, an award. It's actually a VFX award also. It's also produced in gold, so that's also interesting to know those industries. Uh, I did some concepts for a Winnie the Pooh movie. Uh, did some toys for NECA, like the Creature of Black Lagoon, Gollum, a few years back when The Hobbit came out. Uh, this was actually the very first job that I ever did, like Little Gun. Uh, it only took me a day and, and it was tricky, you know, you have to wait because if something, something else came in, but it all turned out well uh, over the end. Next to that, for instance, a broken face. What also happens is people hire me to reconstruct uh, digital scans. 
So when they go to a museum and they scan props, objects, and if something goes wrong or if they do it from live persons, these scans need to be reconstructed and re-sculpted. And that's something also that I do, you know, like help fine artists out with uh, creating their projects. Um, next to that, there's also a little dinosaur uh, and a coin that's from a big uh, um, bat cave uh, thing, collectible, that's coming out from XM Studios. Um, and then also next to that concept art. So I jump from one thing into the other the whole time, but ZBrush is my core program that I start sculpting with. Uh, some designer toys, some stuff for The Walking Dead, some Star Wars stuff, and also some game assets. You know, like, like if somebody approached me and said, like, hey, can you create some fast uh, belts or hats or whatever, or helmets? Like, I jump into the pipeline, I help them. And the only thing that I deliver to all the companies are the high-res assets. So I don't do any texturing, I don't do any retop, I don't do anything, like, I just do the high-res stuff. Uh, and in the corner, for instance, that's something that I did with a children's book illustrator. Like she has a very naive and flat style and she wanted to create statues to uh, put on an exhibition. And I created those, we 3D printed those at very big scale. And she also hand painted the, these to give that, let's say, look and feel of how the thing um, is in her, in her um, artwork. Um, so as you can see, like I jump in a lot of different industries and uh, that's the thing that triggers me as an artist the whole time, like not being stuck purely in games or in something specific. Um, so I'm going to show you a few small breakdowns, how I work for clients. Uh, and they're very simple, you know, like, uh, for instance, MSI contacted me and they want a new mascot for uh, their laptop line. So what I did was like, I do a block out like this, uh, the red one. I do this in one day and I give it to them. And then I'll show them and I'll ask them like, okay, can you give me some feedback? Do you like it? Don't you like it? What do we need to adjust? Then I do like a first uh, coloring pass. Like I just threw on some materials, very simple, like because I'm not doing the final texturing on it. And afterwards, like I refine stuff. Then you go in high res. And then you start like adding little uh, details and everything. And this is still just purely a 2D image, a concept piece. But it helps also afterwards the people that pick it up when my, I deliver my files to them, like how they can texture everything and make everything perfect. And... Um, this is actually the final promo piece that they used also to brand their laptop and everything. But um, the fun part on working on such projects is like, I only do the high res assets and then I give it to the, to the studio and I never completely know what to do with it. And um, sometimes it's very surprising. For instance, like this is the video clip, uh, let's say the commercial. And um, the thing is like, I deliver the files and six months later, like I get an email and say like, hey, this is what we do with it. And I'm, I'm like, oh, cool, like it moves, you know? <laughs> like I never suspected that it would be this and this and how it was looking in, let's say it's personal your own universe because that's all the things that they extended to the whole thing. Um, so, let's see. And that's fun, you know, to see your things come, come to life, to, to see how those things grow um, and how they are uh, applied to, to the whole thing. Because sometimes you're working for clients and you work very hard on a project and you're not sure that it will go to the end of the pipeline, you know, because the client in the end still decides what to do with it or what they will modify. Because it happens sometimes that you work on projects and I'm not the last hand that touches the sculpt or let's say the 3D model because they need to modify certain spots and stuff. So, and the fun thing is like, like the previous still artwork, that's something that I created. And um, the final pack shot, it's pretty close to each other. So I'm quite happy with the result. Another project that I worked on is for uh, Dragon Girl and it was for Planet X. It's a VFX house here in Amsterdam. Uh, what I, they asked me to, to help them out to create, let's say, the digital maquette and then afterwards also the high-res model for Little Dragon. So first I started with some sketches from uh, Wouter Tult. He's a, a Dutch artist. And this was just, let's say, a reference or an input for me to start sculpting. And then I started, let's say, building up the first designs. And this is also created like in one day. Like I just sculpt a quick idea and I toss it to the studio. And then the studio can give feedback to me and then we start iterating and modifying and changing everything. Uh, and we try out poses, we try out how big the wings are, how it would look if it's like rolled up. I do some, some basic texture work on it to, to make it more presentable to the client. And then we start figuring out, okay, what should the scaling look like? Because most of the scales on that thing were 
they were stenciled in, but a lot of them were also hand sculpted. Uh, and we also figured out how would the skeleton be inside the creature because we want to have a simulation system on it. So I created the whole muscle system for it in ZBrush. Uh, and then afterwards, like they exported it to uh, Zavi. It's a muscle simulation uh, uh, system and that picks it up. And also like the skeleton was produced for it. And this is like the final high res asset that I delivered to the studio. And it has like, uh, I would say 260 million polygons. So it's totally cut up into eight different pieces to make the, the UDIMs and everything to make it work uh, towards animation. And this like little small breakdown that they made of uh, how the process worked, how they did uh, the rigging, uh, how it came from, um, let's say the concepting on. So let's have a look. Okay, here we go. So what we see first are the sketches that we started with. And then, like my first inputs, like we started working on the skeleton, the muscle system, like the bones, everything. Then I did some play renders. Then they did the first uh, um, developments on it. Then they start rigging the animation. And that's the fun part because it comes to life, the whole project, you know, I'm just like a small thing in the beginning and afterwards I like I give it away and then I start let's say modifying tweaking it and between let's say the first delivery of the file and this it's also 10 months 12 months until I get those feedbacks uh, from the studio and it's fun also to see like every little scale that you sculpted on that on that beast you've touched that you know that's fun <laughs> to, to recognize certain spots or certain things that you actually designed on it Okay. Another project that I did is kind of similar. It's for a Belgium studio, uh, and they approached me for uh, Ashlat, and they wanted to create a three-headed Norse troll. Uh, so okay, I was like, okay, give me some inputs, and this is what I got from them. Like that should be the proportions. <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> That's a sketch, and start creating it. I was like, okay, cool. Let's jump into ZBrush. Let's figure out how we can solve this thing. And like I pumped out this thing in a few days, let's say three, three days or something to figure out where we were going with the whole project. Uh, and this is all, let's say, created in ZBrush. And there's like a little Photoshop on top too, too. But it's a pure communication thing to show the people like where we are, we're heading. And then after, uh, let's say, certain uh, approvals, you start refining everything. So you start adding more details to the hands, the feet, whatever. Uh, this like a rough pass of the teeth because the thing is like this thing had three heads so also that there had to be more gap for three heads and everything and this like a fine, final detailing pass to add all the little pores and all the little wrinkles on the top of it and this like the final output like how I gave it to the studio and then it's like a surprise how they pick it up what they do with it and I also got a small reel from them like how did they, how did they uh, do the facial animation together with uh, Goodbye Kansas studio in uh, I think Norway so let's have a quick look at that. And it's cool to see the final results also because like you get this, this mix of some kind of CG, but it feels puppetry. It feels like, like there's some, some labyrinth going on in there with the texturing and, and it was, yeah, it's, it's always exciting to see how to pick it up. Also how they solve the hairs and everything because I just give a suggestion in my concepting towards that final result but that's what they eventually let's say produce and here you also see the mocap for the three different heads because that like different dialogue for all the pieces and the thing also for sometimes let's say if you have an insert of a hand or an arm or something like they may might like they might ask to create a more high res version of that because it's like purely detailing um, instead of, let's say, the full figure. Because the systems also need to be able to, to handle all the polygons and everything that you're working with. So. But let's say these are small, big projects because they're done in small teams. They're not like in huge visual effects houses. But I love to work on, on these type of projects because like they're, they're 
you practically know everybody in the pipeline who's working on it, even though I'm always working remote. Um, like you communicate with everybody, you know, and that's, that's the fun thing. But that was, let's say my professional work for small parts. Now I'm also going to show us some of my personal work because most people know me for my personal work. And um, like in my personal work, I always see like mixes uh, in symbolism in design and storytelling. So what comes back in my designs, you'll see it. It's like spirals, it's blacks, it's reds, it's gold. And that's stuff that let's say combines everything for me when I'm an artist. And these are the things that I create as an artist, you know. Um, they might be scary, but they're not, let's say, in your face, jump scare, horror, blood and everything. And all these things are created in ZBrush. Like, I jump in and I start sketching, because these are sketches for me. Like, I knock these things out in a day. Like, I start with a sphere in the morning and I like, just start pumping and moving around shapes and start adding all the details. And the thing is like, I also don't sketch in 2D. Like, I jump into 3D and I do everything in 3D from the beginning. And that's something that I enjoy working um because uh when i picked up zbrush like i made a decision for myself like to skip the 2d part because uh it took too much time for me like i could invest the drawing time into let's say study time sculpt wise so that's why i let's say went in that direction and so on and i also do a lot of 3d printing for myself so little projects that are um yeah, are fun to, let, let's say, to share to the world. And also the good thing is like, I can show all these images to my grandmother. She thinks like, oh yeah, that's, that's nice. You know, like, oh, nice work. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah, but if we continue, you know, and you're able to present a statue or something physical on the table, it's always a different conversation piece because it's something tactile. It's not on a screen. It isn't, it isn't like scary, scary because it's, it's physical. Um, Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well the thing is like I I like to be inspired by cultures and by 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 the things that surround you, you know, like the world. When I go looking for reference, I will never look for reference um on art station for instance, like on on all the like I go looking in in books, hard copies. I love books, you know, like not being on the online all the time. And all of these things are let's say test personal things that I create to also create possible jobs in the future, you know? That's the thing that I always say, always say to young artists, it's like, make sure your portfolio is big and that's, you put a lot of stuff in there that people actually can see that you're that's passionate about what you're working with. But on the flip side, when you're always creating, let's say, dark creatures, uh, people also tend to get the idea that you only can, re can create those things. So sometimes you have to prove people that you also can sculpt other stuff. And that's also the thing that I try to do is like, in between monsters, like I still still try to keep, let's say, my sculpting skills up by doing portraits. I have a few of them later on. So the thumb part of 3D printing, of course, and this is like a big guy. But like I said, portraits, like make sure if you have a portfolio, do some hard surface, do the stuff that you love, but also put in some anatomy, you know, prove people that you also know the skills that you need to have as, as a 3D sculptor. And these are simple projects that I always do. And um, so on. And 3D print them, of course. So now you've seen, let's say, a section of my personal work. You've seen a section of my uh, professional work. And now <laughs> I'm going to try to sculpt something for you live. So that's always, that's always interesting <laughs> how it turns out. So what I'm going to try to do is um, Sculpt a little Cthulhu bust because I've created a lot of Cthulhu things with tentacles and stuff. And let's jump in and see how far we can go. So what I do is when I'm sculpting is uh, I always start from a sphere. And in the beginning, like I just uh, I turn on symmetry, and let's I'm going to scale this thing down a tiny bit. And I first start with blocking out the big shapes. So in this case, like I know it's going to be like a Cthulhu bus. So I'm just going to start with the head. And what I'm doing first is like I'm expanding his mandibles to the side. And when I'm sculpting, use I always use Sculptors Pro because it adds extra geometry while you're sculpting. So as you can see on the wireframe, like over here we still have the original wires, and there while we're sculpting, we add the, uh, the extra detail. So. Let's move this thing around a tiny bit. 
And let's do a little block out on his face. So I'll use the clay brush. Let's do this roughly. So I want to get the eyes in here, the eyebrows somewhere there. Let's scale it down. Like this is also a very convenient pose to sculpt in. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> bear with me, please. <laughs> and I'll add tentacles below this spot. And I'm also checking it from the side, so I'm using plate stuff around with the move brush again, just to get proportions in there. And then I'll add two spheres for the eyes. So let's add those two. And I'll split them off. Uh, let's pop those things to the inside somewhere. Also use the sculpt just, just to add a tiny bit more geometry to it. Then I'll jump to the brush again. Like I have a lot of different brushes in my setup, but in the end, like I only use four or five really different brushes to do all the sculpt work, you know? And then I'll switch out again to the standard brush. And Let's do the eye shapes, the edge of the eyelid. And I use smooth again. So this sucker has two eyes now, great. And uh, let's start sculpting in some finer details. So I'm just using the standard brush. Let's see. And I'm also applying, let's say, the pressure sensitivity while I'm sculpting on the whole piece. And what I'm doing now is like I'll, I'm, I'm sketching in different shapes and forms, and then later on I'll start refining it, re-detailing -de everything. So I'm going to the side here. Uh, let's use an inflate brush. And that's something that a lot of people don't know is that you can actually also sculpt with the inflate brush if you keep it small. So I can add a little edge there. Add the ridge here. And then also again, by using sculptures, smoothing certain sections down. And I try to look at it from all angles while I'm sculpting. And also like when I'm sculpting in the beginning phase, like I don't turn on perspective, like later on, I'll turn on perspective to have an idea what the output will be if it's like in a 3D environment. But in the beginning, it's not necessary, you know. It's a better way to give, uh, let's say, a, a view on, on how you're sculpting everything. And then, let's see if I want to add the tentacles. I'll use a curve brush. So let's see where this guy is hidden. So you can create extra shapes but that's something that we don't want because it doesn't end on the taper so what I can do now is quickly uh, undo this and I can modify the stroke and go to modifiers curve functions and then uh, we'll adapt uh, the size of the end so this is a curve that decides like how it's tapered and by flipping that To the other side it will do what i want it to do and let's quickly draw in some tentacles ah now we're talking now it's becoming a sea monster and now i just start playing with it modifying it and once i'm happy with the base shape like i'll also split off in a separate subtool quickly hide this guy and i'll create two other ones also play with these shapes, tick. Also split up this one. So now we have a base shape to start playing with. And I'll turn off symmetry to create a middle section. So let's do it like this. Let's modify this guy. Okay, also split on mast. And now it's 
just a thing like by using the move brush again and switching out from different subtools. Like I try to insert them. Move this guy backward a tiny bit, give it a little schwung. Insert in here again. And to add some extra details to it, like I'll quickly go to subdivisions, I'll subdivide it. So the quads are subdivided in separate sections. So I have more stuff to work with. And also like I'm going to inflate them a tiny bit because I don't like the tips. So let's give it a bit more volume. And play with this thing a tiny bit more. Okay, let's stretch him out. Okay, this is something that I like more out of the whole system. And I want to make sure that I also see it. That it's okay from all angles. Now also I'm like I'm going to modify the general shape of the head a tiny bit more. Because that's the thing, like while you're sculpting, like you're going back and forth the whole time with the design from all the angles. So let's see how I can make it even a tiny bit better or more interesting. And let's add a tiny bit more detail to these tentacles. So what I'll do is like I'll modify the stroke settings again. I'll go to lazy mouse. So I have a certain delay while I'm dragging my line. Let's hide the other parts. smooth certain details and then jump in again and start refining the head a tiny bit more so. so I want these hooks to stick out and then I'll take the standard brush again and we'll zoom in and to be honest, like this thing is still pretty low res at this stage, but we can, let's say, amp the details, go further with it, and refine all the shapes and the details. And then later on, if you want to push it into a certain pipeline, you can do all the technical stuff that's needed to do the reproduction or the, the baking of the maps and everything, or even decimate it to get it print ready. Um, because I can load up, for instance, an example. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, stop. Like for instance, this is like a head sculpt that I did for a client, but it's kind of build up. Yeah, it's it's like super tiny, <laughs> but it's like super fun to do. And it's like practically build up the same way. And so I start with, with the sphere and I start adding the details, refining the shapes, go further and everything. And um, yeah, stenciling all the details and stuff uh, or a bigger piece that I have also done for a client. And it's more, let's say uh, a toy character and uh, it's a designer toy and it's kind of based on you know the franchise i'm not going to name it it's something that you know as if you're a kid out of the 80s <laughs> but the fun part i'm working on stuff like this is like it's all separated in sections already so it can be printed and completely engineered so sometimes like when you're working on big pieces um, and you need to cut them up, like sometimes action figures exist out of uh, 45, 50 different pieces that all snap together and they're only that tall, you know, so. 
But that's, for example, an exa yeah, those are the things that, that I can show you now. Like, if we go further in detail, but I'll jump back to my little one because I still have a few moments. So in the next stage, when, when you want to apply more details, like I'll use uh, stencil brushes, for instance, like on the trunk. Uh, it is now a geometry uh, density of, of 151 million poly uh, thousand polygons, but we can ramp it up a tiny bit. So let's delete this guy, divide it a few times more. And if I want to give, let's say, a crunchy texture on the nose, or let's say on the tentacle. Oh, the other one. Like, I can easily add and stencil in the skin textures. And also in the next stage, like, I'll still, still be sculpting on those things, you know? Like, I'll add textures. I never work with layers, only if clients ask it to do. But uh, I love to be flexible and start, let's say, jumping back and forth to the high res, the low res, and start yeah, I keep refining the whole piece the whole time. Uh, let's also subdivide this guy two more times. And even when you, let's say, apply um, textures on a low res model, it will break up the tension surface, so it always, always already brings it to life. Like, for instance, there's not a lot of, a lot of geometry happening here, but by even applying, let's say, this texture on it, like it starts to wiggle, it starts to come alive, and that can be, let's say, the next step while you're sculpting to start and refining the details because it's like this is already designing uh, certain shapes. And also, like while I'm, like when you see a full recording and when I'm sculpting on a piece, like I jump on the piece from left to right, top to bottom. Like I never work full time like on on a certain spot because what I've learned is like when you work for clients. The client can ring you up and ask me, ask you like, hey, can you show me a model? And if you only have, let's say, a detailed head, they're not happy. They want to see the whole thing at a certain stage and then like you push forward to the whole piece. It's something very simple, but yeah, some people tend to forget it when they work professionally, that uh, you have to keep communication pretty, let's say, open and clean. Uh, and then also keep everything uh, um, that they know what you're doing the whole time, especially when you're working remote, like, Thank God the COVID that that thing got introduced pretty well. <laughs> That's the one positive thing I think. But uh, yeah, remote work it isn't a problem anymore. Like especially in the industry that we're working in, like I work my I would say eighty percent of my clients are from from other countries the whole time. So. And. Let's add a tiny bit more. Maybe add a tiny bit more geometry here. So I'm smoothing this out. Uh, just blocking in a volume. And that's the nice thing on ZBrush. Like it applies the pressure sensitivity. So depending on how soft you press on your pen, that decides like how hard your lines will be in the end. Okay, and let's add a little plint to it quickly. So I'm going to insert it. Subtool, split it off. Quickly enlarge this piece. Move it around. Okay, add some more geometry to it. And that's how I build up, let's say, all the parts. Like if I do an arm, like I make it in sections, like I start from a sphere, I drag it out, like and then I cut it up again, then I start refining it. And um, later on, like I put everything together in one mesh, so it could be animated or whatever. But in the beginning, like while I'm still sketching and let's say refining all the dimensions and the proper uh, uh, proportions, like I try, I, I love to keep it open with the whole piece. 
So let's say if you want to 3D print this guy and it needs to be flat on the surface. So what we can do is like we can clip the bottom so it's nice and flat. And then also on the sides, like we can easily do this. And we can move the clipping thing around. And then again, like I can dynamesh this. I can also use sculptures again to add some, some more geometry. And the same thing on this, like once I'm happy with the block out, like I just jump in again with simple brushes, like for instance, standard brush. And I just add some thing that could be, let's say a connection to an arm and maybe some pieces that could be the torso or the rib cage. So let's start in the middle. And quickly draw it out. Like this. And this is all still super rough, like I said before. So just using the, right, turn off lazy mouse. And then, like with the standard, I go in again. Smaller brush size, and I just roughen out the inner shapes in between the ribs. Maybe add a little ridge on his uh, shoulders. Uh, let's see. And that's the fun thing, you know, you like can you can experiment with it, you can play with it. Uh, and nothing's final. Like even in the final stage that it happens that I still use a move brush and I let's say adjust, tweak certain shapes just to get them right because you want to have a certain flow while you're sculpting on your designs. Okay. And Let's see. So, I'm just going to tweak this a tiny bit more. And And it's like adding all the little sections and details that makes the whole job fun, you know, while you're working on it. So let's duplicate the eyes quickly. So I want to have the inner piece there. Move these pieces inwards. There we go. And then it's just a game by adding more and more details and polishing up your model, you know. So I'm using the inflate with a smaller draw size. And I already start applying stuff that could be, let's say, wrinkles in the later stage. Maybe add a tiny bit more geometry in here. And use a standard brush just to accentuate these shapes. So there's like something happening on the front of his head to keep it interesting. Maybe two nostrils. Not sure about the nostrils. <laughs> but that's the fun thing, you know, like because it's so flexible to work with the software, you can try out little stuff. So if you do stuff that you like or you don't like, you can even go back through the history line or you just can simply erase them away without any problems. I still have five minutes, that's great. I can create another one. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And the thing is, like, the more that you do the sculpting parts, uh, the, the, the faster that you would become, of course, in the end. Uh, it's something that you have to train, uh, exercise, but it's fun, you know, it's just fun. And you have to keep it fun while you're designing the whole piece. So, I'm just playing around with everything, you know, going back and forth. Then I'll see certain angles, certain corners. I think like, oh, can I have more detail here? Can I jump in there? Um, because in this case, for instance, like nothing set in stone. Like when I work on toys or collectibles, it's very simple. This is the reference. Make sure that everything on that reference is copy pasted exactly on the same spot. And there's no discussion. So, uh, and practically also no short <laughs> shortcuts. Like I did a design uh, or the creature of the Black Lagoon for NECA. And it was an awesome job to work on, but the only reference that I had was black and white stills from a film that's more than 70 years old by now. So it's interesting to figure out like, oh, they made like three different suits. That's something that you figure out while you're, let's say, studying the whole thing while you're sculpting it. And you also, let's say, say to the art director like, hey, I figured out something why something's not matching up. Like we're, we have three different suits. Like how can we solve this problem, you know? Let's see. I'll clip this thing again right beneath the tentacle. Just for fun. Give a little color scheme. Moving the eyes around. Try to make it a tiny bit more angular because I think that will work better. Let's say if we 3D, pr 3D print it or something, you know, visually. Quickly add a tiny bit more geometry on the back of his head. And maybe stenciling some quick details there. So let's see, display, spray, turn off Sculpts Pro, and just to break up the surface. Just to make it a tiny more, more interesting visually. Also, this thing, like, um, yeah, I have a lot of materials, and that's thing. Like while I'm sculpting, like I jump through the materials to see like how it will react because you're still working on a screen and you want to know what could be the final output, of course. Tweak these nostrils a tiny bit more. And that's how I kind of, let's say, roughly sculpt creatures. I mean, you have an idea. 